Hello everyone, this is Alan with the media and content team at Set Schedule. Glad to have you join us for another episode of the Mindset Podcast. Today, Set Schedule CEO Roy Deckel is joined by Jonathan Pritchard, gifted mentalist and consultant to Fortune 500 companies, having founded the Hellstrom Group. Roy and Jonathan discuss how applied psychology and having the right mindset is foundational to success. Jonathan also shares his personal journey from the entertainment inter- industry into consulting and what it takes to truly maintain excellence. Hope you enjoy the episode. Jonathan Pritchard, super excited to have you in today. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for the invitation to be able to share my thoughts, man. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Welcome to the welcome to the Mindset Podcast. And for the two and a half people that don't actually know you, can you give us a rundown of who's Jonathan? You got it. There's a lot under that umbrella. Uh, but m- most often people are interested in my background as a mind reader and how I've traveled the world as an entertainer and then taken those lessons and applied them to the business and coaching world to help people get more out of their mind. So when I saw an invitation from Mindset, I was like, this is perfect. I, I have to be on here. So it sounds like a perfect fit. Well, thank you for being here. So I'll start with the with the, the most obvious question. How did you get, how did you start this? How did, just give me the background. <laughs> well, uh, believe it or not, I was a really, really shy kid. I mean, really shy. And I picked up magic tricks because my dad got me a magic kit one year for Christmas when I was five or six years old. And he figured, yeah, this will be in the trash in a, in a couple of days. And then a year later, I'm still, still working with it. And the magic tricks were fun, but the mind reading tricks were even more interesting. So that was my niche that I specialized in. And ever since it has been one of the best context for me to pursue my curiosity and anything that I'm interested in has a place in that world. So it's it's kind of magic tricks that graduated to mind reading and just take it from there. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'll try to hold myself back and not to be ultra nerdy about my questions, but I want somehow to marry our conversation to the corporate world, and and I'll I'll have to jump right into it now, right? And then we could kind of like zoom out and maybe go to different uh, points. But how do you apply this in your day-to-day in terms of like business development, corporate consulting, advisory, which, you know, obviously, you know a thing or two about? (laughs) So let me see. The Some of the context is that I've been doing a full stage show at Uh, fine art theaters and colleges and in all over the world. And it's a 70 minute interactive mind reading show. I'm not actually psychic. I don't claim to have the mojo. It's all just applied psychology, showmanship and having the moxie to pull off these experiences. So it's just applied psychology, understanding that in this context, most people are going to behave in one of five ways and then planning out common responses for those five reactions. Well, that is website optimization. That is sales training and communication. That's negotiation skills. It's all just communication and information architecture, understanding how normal people respond to a particular situation and then designing your approach to helping people come to the conclusions you would like them to come to. So it's the right information at the right time in the right way to the right person. That's how you have success. So in the corporate world, it's all just communication skills. That's it, client retention, employee retention, leadership, sales, negotiation, marketing. It's all just applied psychology. So that's why Over the years, I realized, wait a minute, I'm the world's greatest thought leader. I challenge any (laughs) thought leader 
to a thought leader off in front of a live audience of a, of a thousand people, I'm going to win. So, so that's how I got kind of going into the corporate world. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let me, I don't know if it's cool to rewind a little bit, but it's technically parallel to the entertainment world, right? I mean, a little birdie told me that you actually participate in the America Got Ta Talent, right? I did. I did. I, it was many years ago, and I got to perform for Howard Stern, Heidi Klum, Mel B., uh, Henry Mandel, and Nick Cannon. I put a paper bag over his head. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so, yeah, that was a, a great opportunity, a wonderful learning opportunity of what big, big projects like that really take, because at home, you see the final production, you see the final polished thing, and to go through it is months and months of your life and effort and saying no to paying gigs so that you'll have the time to go out for this potentially life-changing opportunity, and then your segment doesn't air. You make it on for maybe a second in a promo, right? So it's, it's the, the nature of showbiz. So let me ask you about this, because I mean, again, super nerdy, but w w what did you take from that experience? One of the biggest lessons was something my mentors had told me, and it was really good to go through it myself and see it firsthand, which is there is no single make or break moment really anymore. Uh, back in the day when there were three television channels, okay, if you were on the Carson show, then your career was made. Nowadays, you can be on television. Okay, that's neat. We know that you're good enough for TV, uh, but we're also going to need to see some extra stuff. Or you fail. You get booed by 2,000 people. Eh, who cares? You know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like stubbing your toe. It's really painful in the moment. You'll, you'll remember it for a while, but you know, it's, it's not devastating. So no matter how big the opportunity is or the failure, it really isn't going to be the end all be all make or break thing that you expect it to be in the moment. Okay. Okay. Obviously I couldn't agree more. And, um, yeah, I mean, I love the, I mean, I love the insight I mean, and, and, and makes complete sense. So let me ask you this, you transition, or I mean, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the transition from entertainment to corporate, I mean, that, that kind of like took place. Is there any specific reason as to why you decided to make that transition? There, there is. And I, I kind of always wanted my entertainment to have some kind of message I don't want it to be the look how cool I am show. I want my entertainment to leave people wondering, man, he just did things I thought were impossible. So what are those things that I know are impossible in my own life? Maybe I could make some progress in that direction. So help them kind of question their limits. So I've always wanted to deliver a message of go for it, try it stretch your imagination because if you can't imagine success there's no way it's going to happen right so i've always kind of snuck in a message anyway and i see it as as a slider now do you want entertainment with a little bit of a message or do you want a lot of message delivered in an entertaining way and then there's a, a spectrum there but the main reason why i started going into the corporate direction was doing the show at colleges and signing autographs afterwards and signing books and, and that kind of a thing. And then talking with college students, they'd always have a question be like, man, I, I bet, I bet you're just so outgoing. I could never do that. Cause I'm shy. I'm like, I was a shy kid too. Like, that's not a good excuse. So I would always talk to them about how I've thought about opportunity and making amazing things happen. Then I started getting emails a couple of years later going, hey, I don't know if you remember me. You came to my school. You talked to me for 10 minutes after the show, and it really meant the world to me. And, and uh, here's what you told me to do, and then I did it, and then here's why my life is so much better. 
And when I started getting those kind of emails, I was like, oh man, this, this kind of stuff actually is helpful. Not everybody had my mentors. Not everybody thinks the way that I do. So I, I, okay, I have to share this with the world. What's the best way that I can help the most people, the, the biggest, right? To me, that's business because good business is one of the most ethical things that a person can do. Because if you help a business, you're helping every employee, you're helping the families of the employees now and in the future, you're helping the CEO and the entire board, you're helping their families, you're also helping every single customer because the company is delivering a service or a good or a product that is more valuable than the dollars that the customers are exchanging for. So now you're helping deliver higher quality work for less, less money. Okay, that helps every customer. So every company that you help, you're helping hundreds and thousands of people at a whole bunch of different scales. So if I can go in and help the sales team be more effective, that lands more opportunity for the business that helps everybody. So, okay, these ideas and strategies and ways of understanding people are really, really effective and therefore valuable to companies that understand how important it is. So that's why I started shifting into the corporate world and now I help them in all sorts of different dimensions too. Very cool. So what, what, what is the general format that you kind of like engage with, with a company? The general format is I'm the conduit that mm -hmm. connects them to their important people. That's, that's the most honest answer, but it doesn't really tell you much. Right. My, my expertise is being a public speaker, being in front of a large group of people and being able to hit my marks, say what I need to say and deliver a message. So in a trade show dynamic, I'm the person in the booth that draws a crowd twice an hour. Mm -hmm. And then once there's a huge crowd, I entertain them with my custom scripted presentation that is carefully designed to communicate my client's major marketing messaging mm -hmm. that helps pre-qualify everybody in the audience. And if you're not a good fit, great. Here, take your, your free mind reading trick with you. If all this sounds good, then go talk to Carl over there. So I help my clients connect to more high quality leads in less time, which is mm -hmm. why my clients get two to 10 times as many leads out of a trade show as they're used to. Mm -hmm. Well, as a trainer, I can come in and do a workshop on sales skills, on negotiation skills, or presentation skills, or influence with integrity. So that helps the company connect to bigger opportunities more effectively. Mm -hmm. If they're having a conference, I can be the MC that helps connect the attendees to the speakers and the event as a whole, because the MC is one of the most important details of a conference that nobody ever thinks about organizers kind of go oh yeah well uh, eric is funny around the the water cooler so we'll just have him mc he's never been in front of an audience of a thousand people that have paid good money to be there to listen to these keynote speakers and now he's up there mumbling or hey, everybody is just going to tell you, uh, <laughs> right? And then, and then the, the conference is an utter failure and nobody wants to come back for next year. So that's, that's why the MC is the conduit and the face of the entire event that can help keep the events moving smoothly. If the speaker hasn't been mic'd up yet, the MC's job is to fill that time in an entertaining way so that the audience doesn't even know that there was a hiccup in the schedule. That's, that's the kind of way that I can help my clients connect to audiences. So there's, there's really no, no end <laughs> to the way that companies need help connecting to other people. Like if, if your problem is a bolt 
or a widget or a machine, I can't help you there. But the instant there's a human being involved in the equation, let's talk. Fair enough, fair enough. Hence this conversation, right? This is all about mindset. So I want to kind of like zoom into that kind of conversation. So obviously, you 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 know, like you said, if, if there's a human being, you're a jack of all trades. So as long as there's a, there's a human being. Master right, of right. one, human Master psychology, one. that's it. Fair enough, <laughs> love it. What is in your opinion, here's the bam question. <laughs> in your opinion, when what what is this one single biggest challenge for businesses when it comes to business development, salesmanship, and, and consistent performance? Lack of imagination. That's a short answer. <laughs> I expected that's something it. longer. <laughs> no, man, that's that's it. Because I've I've heard that over and over and over and over again. Something along the lines of, wow, I can't even imagine blank. I can't even imagine doing what you do how you do what you do. I can't even imagine thinking that way. And if you can't imagine a possibility, there's a 0% chance you're going to make it happen. So any solution has to be dreamt up first. And people are creative. You can be imaginative. However, most companies are so risk averse that any kind of spark or creativity looks different and different is bad because different could be threatening. Therefore, we're not going to try anything because it might not work. And that's why you get a, an environment that doesn't reward innovation, doesn't reward imagination, doesn't reward the development of new problem solving. So what you get is a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of what used to work 10 years ago, but we know it's safe. So we're just going to do more of that when it's in no way the right answer for this situation. But Somebody with a little bit of imagination can think of a completely new approach, but that new approach is different, untested. I don't know. We, we're not going to try it. And it's that lack of imagination that keeps people locked into the same problems. Do you think that that problem stems from some somewhat, I'll, be, I'll try to be sensitive about it, somewhat uh, stems from the education system? Yes. Absolutely. I, I survived in spite, not because of the, the education system. I had, a, I had a whole bunch of wonderful teachers who actively cared about me and recognized my, my spark of interest in this weird thing called magic tricks. Okay, cool. But you still <laughs> have to do your homework, Jonathan, right? So I, I love teachers. I hate the education system because it, to me, is a well-designed environment to create replaceable cogs, not cultivate innovation, creativity, and interest and curiosity. It's more a, a test of endurance and willpower, and let's we're, we need to break that down, kill that spark so that you can be a cog in this system. Shut up, keep your head down, do your work, do what you're told, turn in your work on time. We don't want your best. We just want you to meet these limits. Okay, you can be controlled. You can be told what to do. You're a good student. We will now reward you on how pliable you are to control and power. Uh, to me, that's that's a, not a great way to, to go through life. 
Well, obviously, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and this podcast, right? <laughs> uh, and it's funny because going back to the imagination, a couple of days ago, I had this conversation. I'm, I'm actually the product of the equivalent of the Israeli Navy SEALs training. And I served as an officer and I was in the BUDS training or the equivalence of BUDS training, but basically BUDS training in Israel. And we went through first hell week. And when I did that, Facebook didn't exist. MySpace didn't exist. None of that was in existence. So I didn't get to YouTube my training, right? I didn't get to see my future training. And when I got to the first hell week, and actually in Israel, we had multiple of them. But when I got to the first hell week, I realized it was hell week because it was hell. And towards the second or third day, which, by the way, blended because you don't sleep. So you're just basically on your long, long, I don't know, 70 second hour. You ask yourself, you know, how am I going to survive that? And then and doing that conversation, I said it was a pretty simple answer. I just closed my eyes and I said, well, it will stop when it stops, presumably Friday. So Friday will get here. I'm just visualizing my Friday night you know, uh, uh, schedule, and it's going to be when this is over, and I'm rewarded by basically successfully completing this week. Um, so, so I just, it just resonates so much when you said the lack of imagination is, is, is a big deal, and, and I couldn't agree more, so, you know, uh, but what do you think about motivation? And, and, and I'm bringing it up because it's an interesting, I mean, you're talking about psyche and obviously, you know, you, 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 you know how to read it and understand it. Um, and I think that one of the key challenges we see consistently is the lack of constant and persistent motivation. Why, why, why do you think that that's a major issue in society in general? I, I have kind of a contentious relationship with motivation. And I think that motivation is the functional equivalent of emotional masturbation. And that's, that's why it's useless. I don't like motivational speakers. I think that they are selling something that you can't give. So to me, that's called fraud. So I, I hate motivational speakers. I think motivation is one of the worst strategies for accomplishing anything that you want to accomplish because you are holding results hostage to how you feel about something. And I don't care how you feel about something. I care what you're doing, cause and effect, not hoping, wishing, praying, trying to feel a certain way to psych myself into the right state of mind to do my best work, but I don't feel like I'm in my best frame of mind. So I'm not going to do my best work. So I'm not going to do it. And then two years goes by and you wonder why you haven't written the, the new American novel, right? <laughs> so motivation is a handy scapegoat for all your failures. And the worst way to accomplish anything that you set your mind to. Instead, discipline and understanding cause and effect. What do I need to do to create the outcomes that I want? That's what's going to work. I don't care how you feel about it. Just do your work. You'll get the results. Results get you motivated. Motivation gets you nothing. So that's why to me, motivation, I couldn't care less how you feel. I don't care that you're not motivated. Professionals show up, do their work, get the results, get paid, go home. The Motivation is a luxury that amateurs have when they, they're they not on the line for delivering a skill set. So that's, that's why I, I don't like motivation. <laughs> <laughs> motivation. So you essentially want to divorce motivation from the workplace. Workplace, work sorry. You're trying to, to divorce motivation from the workplace, which I can understand your position and I love the, 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 the explanation, but let me ask you this. I mean, there's so many courses out there, right? The AD personalities, you have people that gravitate towards task management. You have people that are gravitating towards more emotional, uh, uh, I guess, intelligence. Um, how do you articulate that to all, right? Because I mean, I happen to understand what you're saying from a mindset perspective, but I'm curious to know, how do you take a group of a thousand people that inherently they have different types of personality and you show them or you explain to them that the best path for success is to divorce yourself from motivation and focus and execution. I, I want to divorce motivation from excellence. 
right? Like if, if you want to be the best, your motivation is not going to get you there. Um, the secret of motivation <laughs> in when I'm brought in to talk about motivation and doing a good job at work, one of the first things I do is to say, if you, if you don't want to be here, please leave. Like you, you you've only got one life and you shouldn't be spending it at a job that you don't want to be at. So you know what? I'm going to be the first person that you've ever seen to give you permission to quit your job right now. Please just walk out. <laughs> Nobody? You sound, okay. You sound like a SEAL instructor. Sorry, I'm just... <laughs> exactly. And it's not reverse psychology. I genuinely want people to leave if they don't want to be there. If you don't want to be there, you're wasting my time. You're wasting your time. You, you shouldn't be in the room. Please go. And I'm being a thousand percent serious. Nobody has. So you, you, for some reason, are in this room right now. You're already motivated. I'm not going to give you that motivation. You already have your reasons for showing up to work, whatever they are. If I want to be a good manager, if I want to be a good leader, it's on me to understand why you keep showing up to work. What is it you're trying to provide for? What is it you're trying to accomplish? Why do you show up at work? That motivation is going to be different for every single person, and they already have it. Then your job is to crawl inside their head to see what it is that they want out of their time at work, and then help them understand why doing a great job at work is the best strategy for them to accomplish the outcomes that they're motivated to accomplish. That's not easy. That's tough work. That takes understanding what motivates people and what outcomes they want. They have to be able to trust you enough to share truthful answers beyond just something like, oh, well, I, I'm just happy doing a good job, Bob, right? Like that's, that's not an easy thing. It's simple, but it is not easy to have that level of trust with your company and employees. So that's why motivational speakers, they're, they're not going to give you anything that you don't already have. You already have it all there. It's on the leadership and management to help communicate. Helping us achieve our company goals will help you achieve your personal goals. And if those aren't in alignment, there's the door will give you a good recommendation to the next opportunity you find. I like your style. <laughs> I like your style. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it because you're very technical. I love it. But um, uh, in your opinion, then, for these employers, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs that are listening to this, what is, in your opinion, the one single most powerful force that uh, they should focus their efforts in, in terms of um, building their business, in terms of inspiring employees to be the best version of themselves? Listening. It's, it's simple. Everybody thinks they can do it, but they can't. Try explaining what somebody just told you to the person that just told it to you you're going to get it wrong. So what you're saying is blah, 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 right? <laughs> what? No, that's not what I meant at all. How did, how did you get that? So the magic phrase you're listening for is, I couldn't have said that better myself. When you can do that, you know you're good at listening. When people know that you understand what it is that they're trying to say, then they are open to hearing your response, your feedback, your insight. That helps with clients. That's going to help you land more opportunities because your prospective client, your lead, won't believe that you're the best fit until they understand that you know their situation inside and out better than they do. 
And then they're going to go, well, he clearly knows this better than I do. And I've been in this industry for 15 years. Okay, maybe maybe he's he's who he says he is. Maybe he actually can help us. Compare that to, oh, we've been on the sales call for two minutes and you're a perfect fit for our off-the-shelf package number two. That's the perfect fit for you, Bob. That's great. It's going to be $5,000 a month. Let's get you signing on that signature line right now. Screw you, man. You don't know the first thing about my business. There's no way in the world that that's going to fit me. Oh, thank you. That Oh, the package number two, you say? Okay, excellent. Well, let me think about it. And I'm going to tell all my friends how bad you were at your job. And uh, we're done here. So that's why listening and being able to help people understand that you understand is the magic sauce for anything that involves a human relationship. Interesting. Why do you think that, that, that you know, I mean, it, it, it's, as they say, it's not rocket science, technically speaking, right? It's people science, but not rocket science. With that said, why do you think people find hard time to change, making changes, you know, period? Because rocket science is math. It's pure cause and effect. And people are not. Like, we consistently pick the non-logical answer that is clearly against our best interests for non-rational reasons that we can't even explain ourselves. So it's kind of like an experiment where there are no constants. Good luck. I would much rather take rocket science because I know that this much, <laughs> this much fuel lit on fire will get this heavy of a rocket this far above Earth. Great. It's all formulas and equations. They're really long. They're very complicated, but it's at least doable. Most people think because they're constantly having things go through their mind that they're good at thinking, and they're not. They're really bad at thinking. Awful. Just the worst. And, and magic tricks are proof that you're just awful at thinking. Because I can walk you through an experience, and two minutes later, you're telling your buddy about something that never happened, that I know didn't happen, because I know what I did, and you remember something completely different happening that I helped you misremember. I help you tell the wrong story, and then later I go, well, actually, I did this, and then you say, no, Jonathan, I know what I saw. You can't tell me what I saw, I know what I saw you do. Okay, all right. So almost nobody is good at diagnosing their own awareness. There's a, a great way I heard it put that you can't read the label from inside the bottle. You're trapped inside your context of experience and assumptions and beliefs. And even if reality and truth is counter to that, you will still only look for the experiences that reinforce your boundaries and barriers. So one, you don't know what you're thinking. So what's the chance that you're going to come up with the effective solution to your problem? Near zero. That's why you need people outside your context who can walk you through Here's what's to do, step one, two, and three, and get you different results to prove that this other strategy gets you better results more quickly. So even, even if you had accurate understanding of what your experience was, that still doesn't mean that you know what to do about it. So it's, it's, it's the kind of classic doctor thing that I know what my symptoms are. I'm experiencing these symptoms. And the doctor goes, all right, what seems to be the problem? You recite a whole list of symptoms. Still, none of that has to do with the problem. You don't know what the problem is because you're not a doctor, but you know what symptoms you're experiencing and how much they suck. So you need a doctor to go, oh, those symptoms. Oh yeah, textbook, here's what the problem is. Even when the doctor tells you what the problem is, that's still not going to guarantee that you would know what the solution to that problem is. 
So there's there's just so many opportunities for you to not know what in the world you're doing and the chances that you're going to be the one to figure it out. I've I've done enough mind reading shows to know that that's zero. <laughs> Tell us how it is. I mean, be be straight with us, Jonathan. I think you're sugarcoating I, things. <laughs> I I wish I wish I could you know be straight with you, but uh, I <laughs> just too feel good, right? <laughs> all right, all right. So on on that note, um, and excluding because I'm listening to you, excluding the listening part, going back to the the art of negotiation, because psychology is a very obviously a big part of the art of negotiation, and I'm curious to. Uh, hear from you what are your thoughts in terms of the most important component that should be incorporated into the art of negotiation i mean outside of of course listening um uh, what do you think that would be if you had to list the top three aspect of uh you know uh the, the psychology and the art of negotiation i would say one never negotiate against against your best interests two have something worth negotiating for and three, work to understand why the other side wants what they're asking for. When you understand their motivation, that's when you can find more creative solutions that everybody is happier with than the classic, let's both give up enough until we're both equally miserable and then we call that a good deal. Uh, but when you understand why somebody's asking for what they're asking for, you might be able to give them even more and get more in return than you originally thought. And that only works when the other side trusts you because they know that you can understand what it is that they're they're looking for. So that kind of goes back to listening as well. Um, but also remember that the reason they're negotiating is that you have something that they're worth negotiating for. If you're selling widgets and you're a commodity and there's nothing that differentiates you from the next guy and the only thing you've got is price, in, enjoy that, that ride to misery because that is just an awful, awful future that you set up for yourself. The bigger the opportunity, the more moving parts, the more opportunity to find creative solutions that help everybody involved, those are the deals I want to be involved with and the kind of kind of things that I want to negotiate for. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And rejection. What are your thoughts about rejection? Why rejection is so terrifying to people, so much so that they will make all the adoption, all the changes, all the knee-jerk reactions in a nanosecond because of rejection. Because they haven't done it enough. <laughs> That's it. <Fair> enough. <laughs> you, you're just not you're just not inoculated yet. Just get told no more, and and eventually you just kind of go, oh okay, that's what this is. <laughs> it's a numbers game. Let's go. And and part of it is the scarcity mindset of I'm not worth this opportunity. Therefore, I can't afford for them to say no because I can't get this anywhere else ever again. So I'm willing to give up a lot of my boundaries for this opportunity. So it's, it's fundamental fear of uh, no opportunity or chances or worthiness. There's just a whole, whole cocktail of bad thinking behind the fear of rejection. But if you're actually awesome and you actually help the world be a better place and you do great work and your clients are over the moon happy, sucks to be the person to reject you, pity them. Like, I'm, I didn't do my job to communicate how much I could help you. Like I, no sane person would say no to, to this awesome opportunity. So I'm I'm sorry for you that you've rejected me, uh, but I get it. I get it. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. So some some people are going to say no, and that's their loss. So you just you know realize that you do amazing work, and if you don't do amazing work, 
uh, that's a big issue. So work on that piece of the equation. Uh, fair enough. Love it. <laughs> we preach it all the time. <laughs> I agree. Um, I have a, a question from the audience. I'm kidding. It's from our producer here. And I, 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 I'll I, preface it by saying maybe I didn't do the listening. And I don't know where the question is coming from. So excuse me if I'm not asking it correctly. But yeah. isn't, isn't, uh, what was it? isn't Kung Fu a bunch of punching and kicking? Yes. Oh, I. this is one of my favorite rabbit holes. Like I love Kung Fu to me is life science because it's the study of cause and effect within physical dimensions i don't care what you're thinking about i don't care what you're worried about i don't care what you're wishing for i don't care what you're expecting but when you're getting punched in the face there's not a lot that you can freak out about what are you going to do about it okay, now we're talking. So it's, it's a laboratory to understand how useless all these hopes and wishes and I'm going to feel angry about it, or I'm going to feel motivated. And then you see that none of that works to avoid getting punched in the face. You, you learn real quick, oh, I should probably move. I should, I should put my hands up. I should dodge out of the way. Oh, so the quality of my well-being is the result of how well I respond to what's actually happening. Oh, now I know I have to pay attention because if I wasn't looking, I get punched in the face. And it is such a wonderful gift to find people who love you enough to punch you in the face to, to help you grow as a person. So to me, Kung Fu is a lot more than just a whole bunch of punching and kicking. It is the fundamental layer that teaches you how to manage your well-being in a physical way. And learning that is a fundamental process of learning how to manage your emotions, your mindset, your energy at the most abstract level. But if you can't even manage your physical body, why in the world am I going to listen to you about your energy and energy alignment? If I can punch you in the face, I don't need to listen to you about managing emotions and energy levels because you can't manage the fundamental layer that dictates all the other ones. So I now have a very easy, easy filter for should I listen to what this person have to say? Can I punch them in the face? No. Okay. Then maybe I, I should pay attention. Well, <laughs> another thing you may not know about me, I've practiced karate for 12 years when I was a kid before I joined the Navy uh, in Israel. So I listened to you and I could have not said it any better. So, so good as to you. I love the way you explain Kung Fu. I did it karate, <laughs> but I like the Kung Fu aspect. That's one thing. Second thing is remind me to never see you in person because it sounds terrifying. I'll keep the virtual I, relationship going for us. <laughs> but, I, but I will, I'll do it with love, right? And, and only if you pay me a lot of money. That's the only kind of people that I'll punch in the face. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, well, Jonathan, uh, what can I say? I, um, I, like I said in the beginning, I don't think we, we've allocated enough time. And I, I mean, I'd love to uh, have this conversation again sometime soon, hopefully with a little bit more kicking and screaming and punching. Yes. Um, but uh, if you're game, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have you on the show. <laughs> don't you threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the time, and I think it was it was super insightful, and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we'll wrap this one up, but we're definitely going to connect soon for another episode. Deal. Thank you for your time, you. Jonathan. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, have a good one.